former ITV news presenter Isla Truckwear uh, was a prisoner in her own home, all because of one man. His name was Jonathan Barrett. Yeah, uh, he became obsessed and infatuated with her when she moved next door to him uh, and just last week was convicted of stalking. Now, wow, Isla joins us now to share her story. Welcome. Hi, Isla. So lovely to see you. Thank, thank you for, for sharing the story. No, I feel it's important to talk about it, so. Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, obviously, when you're buying a new house, it's one of the most exciting mm. things mm. ever. We go and we have a look at the house, we check it out, we, you know, scope mm -hmm. it first. And you went to scope a new house. Yep. And you met the neighbour yep. next door yep. and you had a terrible encounter. Tell us what yeah. happened. Well, I'd already had the offer accepted, but I took my mum to the area to go for a walk. Came back, found that my car had been blocked in, gate shut and a van parked in front. Uh, he came out. My mum has mobility issues following two strokes, so she's got a little mobility scooter, and I said, she needs to get in the car, you need to come with me. So he accused me of trespassing onto his garden, letting my dog foul there. And I said, I don't have the keys to the house, I can't even access the garden. So what I did was, I felt uncomfortable with this, my offer had already been accepted, I was financially kind of, you know, committed. But I went back two weeks later to try and, I just, I wasn't happy with it. Knock on the door, and a woman answers, and I'm appeased, thank goodness, he's sure. got a partner, a wife. Yeah. And I said, I need to clear the air. He came round and I said, please don't ever do that again. And I need you to accept that just did not happen. Um, so he was quite friendly after that. And then, you know, it was the, that was in the October 2020. And then in the January, I got the keys. So initially, I was quite happy that he was being more friendly after that initial. So incident. you went before you, were, you bought the house to have a look. Uh, you had this altercation. He was swearing. He wasn't very nice. And then was, was there a point you thought, you know what, I'm going to pull out of this this sale? Did you ever think that? Well, there was just that one incident before, uh, and I'd already had the offer accepted at that yeah. point, so I, I kind of was committed. But as I say, I felt appeased by the conversation the fact that I'd the woman had. Was there. But then when I got the keys in January, I started doing renovations. So I wasn't living there, but I was there every day, morning till night, painting, knocking down walls. I learned how to plaster. I was very hands on myself. And what I became aware of was that. There was just an unhealthy interest in what I was doing. Uh, he he was always outside the front or the back if I was there, and and always wanted to talk. And it was I would like be carrying a 25 kg bag of plaster, yeah. saying, "I'm sorry, I don't want to be rude, but I need to go in the house." But then there were certain comments being made about. He said something about me being vain. I was wearing animal onesies with you know a hat on, <laughs> doing the renovations, covered in filth, sometimes carrying a pipe that had poop in it you know yeah. this is not the glam job yeah. thing so I thought maybe he maybe I, you know he maybe had looked me up or knew something about my background. I don't know at what point did uh, an unhealthy interest or, or you know him being a little bit more than neighbourly push over in your opinion to, to, yeah. to behaviour that you were Sort of, you thought it was slightly more sinister and uncomfortable. Yeah, there was an incident that was brought up during the court case, actually. He had climbed over the back wall and came in through my conservatory. I wear headphones, listen to podcasts, doing the work. So I got a bit of a fright. And he sort of says, you haven't eaten, have you? Uh, and uh, I, I said, oh, what you're seeing now is him actually naked in the garden. This is after I get a camera and fence put in, and he's putting a collapsed clothes horse against my fence. That's a fence I had to put in to stop him. That's where he climbed over, though, previously. What's came he into doing with, the, with clothes horse? I don't know. I thought it was a ladder when I first saw it. This was triggering my motion sensors. I was actually on the phone to a police sergeant when that was going on. So that's my house right there. He's naked. He can be overlooked by any of the other neighbours as well. And there's children that live nearby, so that was alarming. Anyway, he came in this day and he said, you've not eaten. And I'm like, uh, you, you, uh, you like salmon, don't you? Now, he may have brought up something previous about a butcher and I may have said, I don't eat red meat, but he'd, he'd clocked this. Right. So he came into he your He came house. into my home through the back without me realising. And he'd come in before, he'd come in the other at the front door, but the door was sometimes open. There's builders going in and out. So I, I was kind of... But still. It's not OK. So he'd been watching me, he knew I was hungry, and he said in court something like, uh, when he was giving evidence, that my energy was flagging, and that's when the magistrate said, Ooh. you've been watching her. Right. So my conservatory sided onto his garden. There's a glass brick window sided onto his garden. So those are his key points. And the other places were in the front of the house. There's a lawn. He could stand and look right into my bedroom. Where he parked his van, he could stand, look right down into my bedroom. Mm. And this was just oh going goodness. on. So it started with small things. I tried to, you know, put in a bush, put in some bamboo screening. Bamboo screening resulted in him, um, cut, you know, butchering my hedge, which we could only assume was done in anger. This was all brought up during the court case. But of course, if I hadn't videoed or photographed it, sure. you know, be taken off the charge sheet. This is a, quite an uncomfortable question to have to ask because it yeah. shouldn't be. You shouldn't have to do this. Mm. But was it? Did you ever have a conversation with this partner? I did, I did absolutely. Um, 
the first time he shouted and swore at me, she witnessed it and I went over. This is, I had to delay moving in because of it. And she explained to me, this was just from her saying he had some mental health issues, I believe undiagnosed. So I had compassion yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was more tolerant. But then when the, after the hedge incident happened, I said, I'm really sorry. I, you know, I want to respect you as a woman and your partner, but you know, your relationship with your partner, but he's spying on me. And I said, when you're at work, because she was out every day, yeah. And then she said, no, no, it doesn't make any difference. I know he's doing it. It doesn't matter if I'm at work or not. She said, I've told him to stop doing it. He just likes to stare. And she tried to minimise. I said, no, I'm scared by this. Um, and, and she said she would talk to him. So she went from kind of, a, you know, being sympathetic to me, then saying, I've got, you know, it's not my problem. And it was after that, um, she refused to be present. She wanted me to talk to him. And I said, I'm not going to do that. He's violent. You know, he'd had an aggressive reaction to me before. Sure. And that's when I got the police involved. But me phoning the police was not them coming over and sorting out. It took a long time. Yeah, tell us about the process. How did that happen? So I phoned and I had a long conversation and I was advised, you know, write everything down, report every single incident to 101, either phoning up or through their email system. Yeah. Um, photograph and video safely, whatever you can, and keep a stalking diary. So I'd already t started taking notes. I mean, I have a catalogue of voice messages to my friends going, oh, my God, he's doing this. Oh, my God, he's standing oh at the window. Goodness. So, there, you know, I literally could use my... Was you protected as well in that <clears throat> process? No, like no, no, no. Uh, well, he was, I would feel, because they didn't go and talk to him. And then I, I, I got... He was behind me in a van. Uh, I was trying to avoid him, so I pulled into a farm track to a, farm, a remote farm shop that's unmanned, and he swerved in behind me. He turns <laughs> his van around, well, he mean... blocks the thing. I did, one day I didn't have my phone on me, so I phoned the police again. Right. And then it took them another few days before they finally came And over. let's not forget, you're in a rural area, so, yeah. so all these things are heightened, right? Yeah. You're not around I live on my people, own, people, right, my family sure. aren't nearby, yeah, yeah. COVID. People yeah. weren't even allowed, you know, all this was going on at the same time. So eventually, community police officers came over, two women, fantastic, gave me a plan of action. The plan of action was not deployed. I'd actually moved out, so uniformed taser-trained officers were going to go over, say, stop doing this, you'll get arrested. She's getting a fence put in, she's getting cameras put in, behave. But they didn't go when they were supposed to. The guy who went said, oh, he seemed quite nice and polite, said you've misunderstood. And I said, did you inform him the fence is going up because I want to prevent a big reaction? He said... Uh, you can tell him yourself. And I said, I've been told not to contact him. And he said, I'm not going to be your go-between. He got taken off the case. So a new officer gets on it. I mean, this is what I was dealing with. I had yeah, to get in sure. touch with my local councillor who contacted the inspector who phoned and apologised. And, and it went on and on and on. So this was the first phone call to the police was the beginning of June. Um, I just had to keep moving out. It got worse and worse. Um, uh, you know, there's so many sounds incidents, it's hard to horrific. even it tell. It sounds yeah. absolutely horrific. What has yeah. the situation now? Well, I moved out. Uh, I moved out on the advice of police stalking experts and a psychologist, a criminal psychologist. They See, said move out because there was no... Um, there is actually a new law that came into force in 2020 called stalking protection orders. They're rapid response orders that are supposed to be put in place with virtually no evidence, just if someone's at risk of being stalked. Yes. It's designed to protect you, but Wiltshire Police, I believe, had one in place at the time. I don't think the magistrate had ever seen one before. Wanted me to go in and give evidence. And then I was told by the police lawyer... If you go and give evidence in a civil court for this SPO, the criminal charges could be dropped because it'd be an unfair trial. I'm yeah, a criminal journalist, so I knew all this. Yeah. You know, I, I, I had a knowledge. I'd never covered stalking cases before. I had no clue of the impact stalking would have, and it's absolutely devastating. So then, finally, um, uh, we got a, a court date, but I was told that the CPS wanted to drop the case because I had moved to America. I was temporarily living with my brother. That was our solution. Well, she's not there. I own that house. I can't live in it. Sure. He's there. It's awful. So I contact the chief constable to ensure my case isn't dropped. Like, these are things normal people right, wouldn't do. you have to do, yeah. go those extra I know miles how to do to it. Sure this, yeah, I'm a you. crime journalist. I'm assertive. I've been a television presenter. I can talk in public. I'm not scared to fight. But it was breaking me inside as a person. It was destroying me, you know, I, anxiety, panic attacks, sleepless nights, you know, it's ruined my life and the you past still, year. And you still yeah. live in that as well now? Yeah, yeah, I'm still... I had two hours sleep last night. Oh, I was anxious God. about coming on. I've never talked about my personal life and being a victim is not something I enjoy. I'm yeah, speaking purely to raise awareness that this is something that's not taken seriously by the police. For sure. Do you worry that speaking out might make it worse? Oh, yeah. Well? 
Yeah, I mean, the, I've already reported, I'm going to have to say, an alleged breach of his restraining order the mm -hmm. day after he was given it last Thursday. So Friday, I had to make a report to the police. Oh, I love Through the website, which I have still to, you know, I've got a, we've ignored, you know, we've got it, whatever. So the SPOs aren't working. The CPS aren't taking it seriously. When I was in court giving evidence, I discovered from the prosecution barrister, who was wonderful, by the way, she told me she didn't, I mean, the magistrates are like, do you have evidence of the damage to the hedge? And she said, no. And I'm like, you've got the photos and videos. Didn't have them. And she said I'd been let down. So we scraped that yeah. conviction by. There are very, very few. The last figure I looked up, which was a couple of years ago, is 0.1% of convi our convictions. And what will happen to him now he's been convicted? So we have to wait for sentencing. They've deferred for reports. But because this is a Section 2A, which is without fear and harm, 4A is with fear and harm, the maximum he can get is six months. And I really don't believe that's what's going to happen. He'll get yeah. community service. Okay. And the restraining order is for a year. Um, so it's not good. But listen, I know that was tough coming on, but thank you for coming on, because if you're sharing your story and people yeah. are going through similar, um, then, you know, you could, you. you could prompt someone to pick up the phone. I do need to thing. say, the CPS says we understand how traumatic stalking can be for victims. and know the criminal justice process can also be challenging experience for those affected. The defendant was successfully convicted and we are committed to securing justice for those um, cases where our legal test is met. Also, the Wiltshire Police said, we take all reports of stalking and harassment incredibly seriously and would always encourage victims to come forward. I'm sure Thank that's you for sharing probably your not story. a reality that you recognise. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. Well, anyway. Thank you for having thank me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.